Thank you, Pastor Larry. Well, good morning. So I'm going to share with you guys a, a heartwarming story this morning of some family support that I received this week. Let me make room for my all my stuff here. So I was sitting around at home this week, and I was sharing with Jimmy about these verses that I was going to teach about. Which ones I was going to cover, all of that. So just, just sharing with him. And one of my dear children was sitting in the room. She wasn't involved in the conversation. She was just sitting over on the couch doing her homework. And so I was sharing with Jimmy, and I made a reference to something that Pastor Gaddy had covered in the previous verses because he taught last Sunday. And when I made that reference, all of a sudden, her head popped up from the computer where she was working, and she said, Pastor Gaddy taught Sunday school last Sunday? I said, he did. And she said, and you're teaching this Sunday? Pastor Gaddy taught? And now you're following? I said, uh-huh, that's right. And she said, good luck. <laughs> yeah, so I, I come to you this morning with those words of encouragement just ministering to my heart. Good luck. <laughs> We're going to start with 1 John chapter 3, verse 11. We're going to dive right in. Um, for this is the message. This is it. This is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. This verse is confirming the teachings of the prior verse. That he who doesn't love his brother is not of God. This is the message that you've heard from the beginning. It's part of the foundation of Christ's teachings. He declared in his teachings from the beginning, we should love one another. The word for message here meant commission or commandment. It's our duty as believers to love each other. This love that we're to have for one another is a special fruit of our faith, and it's a sign of that faith. Verse 12 says, Not as Cain, Pastor Larry mentioned Cain in his introduction, not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brother's righteous. So this verse is telling us, don't manifest the spirit that Cain did. He was of the wicked one. That meant he allowed himself to be under the influence of Satan. So let's look at Genesis chapter 4 real quick, verses 4 through 8. So we're not supposed to be like Cain. So let's, let's look at exactly how Cain was. Abel, Cain's brother, also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. That's a powerful verse. The Lord saying to Cain, if you do well, you'll be accepted. Another translation says, won't you be lifted up? If you do well, won't you be lifted up? So instead of this gloomy, despondent mood, walking around with a defeated look. You'll be lifted up. You'll have peace and a clear conscience. He's saying, Cain, you're obviously upset, but it doesn't have to be this way. Now, this made me think about my life and times that I've gone through struggles, and when I took an honest look at those struggles, I had to admit that they were coming from some choices that I was making. Now, that's hard to hear sometimes, but 
sometimes I have to look at the choices that I'm making and choose to do good. And that will help me with the the situation that I'm in. The next part of the verse says, and if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. Its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. It's crouched there. It's ready to devour you. But you can resist it. You can overcome it. Thank God for that. There's an enemy of our soul. We know that. He's seeking to destroy us, but we've got a higher power. Amen. It allows us to be victorious over that if we choose to follow after him. But unfortunately, that is not the choice that Cain made. Verse 8. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. These passages show us that Cain allowed himself to be under the influence of sin. He acted on his feelings of anger and envy toward his brother, and it led him to actually kill him. So going back to our verses, 1 John chapter 3, the apostle here is warning those that he's writing to to guard against indulging in any feelings that are the opposite of love. It warns us that lack of love for our brothers and sisters leads down a dark path, a path we do not want to go down, a destructive path, just as it did for Cain. We can't harbor those feelings. We can't allow them to take root in our hearts because they carry with them the spirit of murder. Let's keep reading verse 13 through 15. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. We'll look at verses 14 and 15, and then we'll, we'll go back up and cover 13. Verse 14, we know we have passed from life to death because we love the brethren. We have passed from spiritual death to spiritual life. Ephesians 2, 1 says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin. We're made alive when we repent of our sins, when we turn from them and follow after the Lord and the plan of salvation. We're made alive. We know we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. We know it's happened because of this love that we have. We don't pass from spiritual death to spiritual life because we love the brethren. It isn't because of us passing from death to life. It's the effect of it. It's the evidence of it. The fruit of our efforts to follow Jesus and be like him will include this great love for people. Verse 15, whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So he who hates entertains the spirit of a murderer. He lays himself open to that influence of those negative feelings that if left unchecked, if not for the fear of punishment, if left to just have full reign, would lead to murder, just as Cain did to Abel. It's so serious. That secret grudge, that, that envy that we're holding in our heart, those carry with them murderous tendencies. And God will hold accountable he who carries those ungodly feelings in their hearts. He judges people as he sees them to be in their hearts. So I could have those feelings and I could hide them. I could never act on them. I could never even voice them. But if I've got them in my heart, the Lord will see that. And he will judge me accordingly. That's strong stuff this morning. That's strong stuff. i got to confess to you, when I was studying these verses, I had to do some, some soul searching. I was like, 
I gotta make sure that I don't have any of those feelings in my heart. And if I do, I gotta get them out. I can't let them take root there. One of the things I found really interesting about these verses is there's no medium given. Did you notice that? There's nothing in between love and hate. There isn't love, hate, or indifference. It's just one or the other. There's no middle ground. You either love or you hate. There's life or there's death. And we got to choose love. we got to choose love. Let's go back up and look at verse 13. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. Don't marvel. Don't be surprised if it happens or, or think it's strange. In fact, just expect it. Expect it to happen. Mentioning the great likelihood that the world will hate believers shows even more clearly the need for us to love and support each other. Strong, tender affections among Christians. We see this happening in our culture, don't we? This, the world, when I say that, unbelievers having some some hatred and looking down upon believers. We see that happening. Culture's getting further and further away from the teachings of the Bible. You know, there are many times that we as believers will go against the grain of culture. There will be those who don't like that. They're even angered by it. And the more we become like Jesus, the less we'll be like culture in many ways. You know, the, the world, the unbelievers, they don't hate the church that's just like them. That's lukewarm, satisfied just to blend in. They don't hate that. But when we live a radical life for Jesus when we are sold out to him, boldly sharing our faith, standing it for what's righteous, then we can expect that we may be looked down upon at times and even hated. So it's even more important that we have each other to lean on. We go about the business of living as sheep among wolves. As Jesus told us in Matthew ten eighteen. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Sheep use their natural herding instincts for protection. You know, they're, they're prey animals, but they herd together for safety. We need each other. We depend on each other. We lean on each other. And as we go about with unbelievers, sharing our faith, spreading the good news, even when we don't know how to be received, it's so comforting, isn't it, to know that we've got the support and the prayers of our brothers and sisters in the Lord. I wonder, can you think of a time that you have felt the love and support of a fellow believer? I'm going to give you a moment to think about that, and I'll share a couple of times that I thought of when I was preparing for this. It's almost four years ago that Jessica Pelkey and I started the kitchen ministry. That's our drive-through ministry every other Thursday night, feeding the community. So it was about four years ago, actually this time of year, that we started talking about that and announcing that. And we weren't really sure how we were going to navigate volunteers. You know, we had never done this before, so we didn't know. We thought about having a schedule, we, we didn't know exactly, but we started just making some announcements and saying, hey, if you'd like to help, you know, let us know. And Teresa Castile, who's here today, she came up to me after church on a Sunday, and she said, hey, I just want to let you know, me and, me and my girls, we're going to help you. I said, okay, well, that's great. You know, we don't expect any one family or one person to be here every time. We, we might do a schedule. We're not sure. And she said to me, you just put us down. We're going to be there. You just put us down. And, Teresa, when I was thinking about this this week, it occurred to me, with the exception of one Thursday night last May, which is when Teresa's youngest daughter graduated from high school, and it happened to be on a Thursday night, with the exception of that Thursday night, I believe every kitchen, we've had at least one member of that family, and most of the time more than one member, here helping for almost four years. That made me feel loved and supported by my sisters in the Lord. And that's beautiful. A more recent example, 
Celinda and I, out in the parking lot of all places, shared with Sister Charlotte Kidder some, some new things that are happening in our lives and our ministries. And her reaction was so beautiful. You can tell when someone is genuinely excited and happy for you. You know, there's a, oh yeah, that's great. But no, it was, it was genuine. And a few days later, I received a card from her just with some kind words. And that means so much from somebody that you admire taking the time to say, hey, I'm, I'm proud of you and I'm happy for you. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. And that's how that the church is designed to operate. So you've had a moment to think of some examples in your life. Now, this could be someone from New Life Church or from another area of the Lord's church. But has anybody thought of something and would be willing to share a 30-second testimony, 30 seconds of when you have felt loved and supported by a brother or sister in Christ? Anybody willing to share? 30 seconds. You don't have to preach a message. 30 seconds. Anybody? I'm going to pick on my husband if nobody else raises their hand. Sister Carolyn, awesome. Thank you, sister. So mine was when I started a ladies' Bible study at my house. Okay. I don't do that. I don't. Now, I'll bring the coffee cake. I'll make the coffee. I'll do whatever you need me to do, but I don't do the study. So I was very, very nervous about it. Um, and my felt love moment was after we did it and it's growing we've grown out of the dining room we're going into my living room brother john can't stay there anymore now he's got to leave because he's been pushed out kind of thing um was i got a card from someone here that i hold very very dear to my heart that told me how proud they were that i had stepped out and and done that and that they could see that growing more and more and more that is awesome you know, I've talked a lot about courage and having courage to, to step out when the Lord is pushing us out of our comfort zone to do something for Him that maybe we've never done before. And when we have people in the church, brothers and sisters, that come alongside us and say, I'm proud of you. This is great. Keep up the good work. That encourages us to keep going, doesn't it? That's beautiful. Anybody else? 30 seconds. Oh, yes, ma'am. Let me bring you my microphone here so we can all hear you well we've been here a little over a year and we're still trying to get to know everybody and uh, sister Rachel and brother Matt have been great mentors for us and great friends so as we're learning everybody um, <clears throat> a couple weeks ago my mom got diagnosed with esophageal cancer and um, some of you know, and some of you may not, and that, that's okay. Um, but I was working and just thinking about the days ahead of my mom. And um, I got a text from Sister Ashley Smith that said, Hey, lady, I'm thinking of your family. I'm praying for you. We miss you. We've been thinking about you. And that meant so much to me. Um, not knowing Sister Ashley Smith very much or really knowing a lot about her and, you know, her life. But she took the time to, uh, of her schedule and her life things to think about me and my mom and what we were going through right now. And it meant so much to me. And it made me feel loved at that moment in my life when I was working and thinking about what I'm going to do, what we're going to do. And um, thank you, Sister Ashley, for taking the time to uh, show your love to me. It meant so much to me. That's beautiful. Bearing one another's burdens, as the word of the Lord tells us to do. Bearing one another's burdens. Just getting that text or a card or a word, a call, can mean so much during those difficult times. Thank you guys for sharing. First John 
verse 3 and 16. And we also by this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. The miracle of divine love is that Jesus would redeem the church with his own blood. Surely, we should love those that Jesus loved so much that he was willing to die for them. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. For the good of the brethren, if necessary, of course, this doesn't mean we are reckless with our own lives or throw them away, but we should be willing even to go so far as to lay down our life if it should be necessary, if circumstances should demand that. The spirit that led the Savior to sacrifice his life for the good of the church should be within us, leading us to be willing to do the same if necessary. That's the kind of love that we should have for each other. Now, we've covered the need to be willing to literally lay down our life, but there's another kind of laying down of our life, and that's laying down our lives through service, through serving others. God calls us to lay down our human tendencies toward selfishness and to honor and serve others before ourselves. By this we know love, because he had laid down his life for us being called to a deeper level of love for each other. Jesus is our example. To love another person, not just because we like them and we have common interests, it's easy to do that, but to love them and view them as a child of God, God's child. I have to treat that person with dignity and respect and love because that's God's child that I'm talking to. I tell you, I got a hold of this a few years ago, and it absolutely changed my life. This idea to look at everybody that I come in contact with as God's child. I know how I feel about my children, and I can't love the way God loves because he's so much greater than I am. But just the, just the earthly love that I have for my children, and to think that that's how God looks at all of us, except even more on a whole, a whole other level. You know, we're talking a lot today about specifically loving our brothers and sisters in Christ, but this applies to, to everybody. That person that just made me angry. That person that just posted something on Facebook that I absolutely do not agree with. And I'm thinking, what in the world? That's God's child. I'd be careful. I'd be careful how I respond. Because that's God's child I'm dealing with. That's God's creation. Cain, the Lord said, it doesn't have to be this way. You can overcome it. His grace is beautiful. It's beautiful to the precious soul that comes to see our on a Thursday night active in his addiction. He's not here because he wants to make a change. There's a lot of people that are here because they want to make a change. But there's a few that aren't here because they want to make a change. They're here because they're made to come. To that person that comes in, and I, I go over and introduce myself when he walks through the door and he pushes his paper into my hand and says, here, can you sign this? And I say, well, well no, sir, we sign those at the end of the evening. We'll just sign it now. Well, no, no, sir, I'm not going to do that. But I'm Miranda. It's nice to meet you. Well, I just want you to sign my paper. Now, here's the thing. Me or another member of the team, we could choose to get frustrated by that. But are we going to? No way. No way. Because that's God's child that's standing there that he created and that he loves and that he died for. And I have to think, if that were my child in that condition... How would I want her to be treated? And that's how I'm going to respond with appropriate boundaries, but with so much love, dignity and respect and love. And that's how we strive to treat our brothers and sisters in the church too, and even more so, we're this family of God together. 
we're called to treat each other with love and service that honors God. I just think that's so powerful. I've been driving down the road and somebody cut me off. And man, it just makes me so mad. And I think that's God's child. You've got you to gotta be nice. You've got to watch how you respond. That's the Lord's child that you're dealing with there. It changed my life. I, so sometimes just simple things get a hold of me. And this was one of them. And it changed me. Verse 17, but whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? That's livelihood, this world's goods. So if we ought to be willing to go so far as lay down our life if it was required, then how much more should we be willing to share our earthly goods if needed? Whosoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, doesn't show compassion, turns his head from his dire need, how does the love of God abide or dwell in him? The apostle wants to show here that love shows itself through action. Through action. Some of the most direct evidence of love is showing compassion to those who are in need. And I just got to say, I'm so thankful for the people of New Life Church. I have seen this play out in so many of you, helping others, helping people inside the church when, when there's things that go on and they need support, gathering around to help and helping people that are outside of the church. And I am so thankful for all of you that I can see that playing out in, that my children get to see that, that example of this being lived out before them. I'm so thankful for that. That is the evidence of God's love dwelling in us. Verse 18, my little children, let us not live in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Let's not just profess love for each other, but let our actions show it. Verse 19, and by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him by our living in deed, action, and in truth. We know we fulfill the commandment to love, and we are real disciples of Jesus. One commentary read it like this. Having herein the truth radically, we shall be sure not to love merely in word and in tongue. I love that word radically. I love it. I want to love others radically. I want to live for Jesus radically. It's so exciting living for the Lord and loving people like that. It's exciting, thoroughly, completely sold out to it, stepping away from selfishness, stepping away from doubt, and just going all in. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like it shall assure our hearts before him, our hearts, the seat of compassion in the sight of the one who searches our hearts and knows our hearts. Verse 20, for if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. He's the maker of our hearts and knows it. He knows our intent, our innermost thoughts and feelings. Verse 21, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. So if we indulge in no secret sin, if after thorough examination with sincerity before God in our hearts, and they, our heart doesn't condemn us, we can have confidence toward God. We live in a way that shows evidence of our personal relationship with Him, and we can look forward with confident hope toward heaven. We have nothing that would hinder us from standing before him in humble confidence. Those who love the brethren, as we are called to, have confidence in their relationship with the Lord. Verse 22, And whatever we ask, we receive from him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. We will receive what we ask for him, of him. If we are truly his children, and we ask in a proper manner, James 4, 3, 
You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your own pleasures. So we have to ask in a proper manner. And the thing asked for us is what's best for us because the Lord knows. He knows if we're asking something that's best for us. 1 John 5, 14. Now this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So because we keep his commandments, that furnishes evidence that we're his children and he hears his children. Do those things that are pleasing in his sight. He's pleased by our obedience and our submission to his will. We can call on him as our father. We can pour out our requests with confidence in his power, faithfulness, and willingness to supply our needs and fulfill his promises to us. Not that our merits earn a hearing of our prayers. We can't earn it, but as we grow closer to him, our spirit aligns more with his and our requests will align more with his will. Psalm 66, 18, the psalmist writes, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. If I regard, if I seen it and didn't address it, iniquity, sinfulness in my heart, if I didn't repent of it and turn away from it, but instead just knowingly left it there, the Lord would not have heard me. 1 John 3, 23. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. This is the foundation. Believe and love. If we neglect to do this, no other commandment can be kept. But if we do this, all the others will be easy. Believe and love. Notice it says, this commandment, singular, not plural, not two commandments. It's, this is one. They're together. They're united. We can't truly love the way we're called to love without faith in Christ. And we can't truly believe and follow after him without love. So the two are together. Verse 24, now he who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. We have this intimate union with him. We know it. We can have confidence in it. The Savior promised he would come and make his home with his people. John 14, 23. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come and make our home with him. John says we have proof this has happened by the spirit he gives us and the fruit of that spirit. We remember what the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Romans eight sixteen. the spirit himself bears witness to our spirit that we are the children of God. As Pastor Larry comes, I want that evidence, that fruit of the Spirit to be born in me and in my life and to be seen, to be played out in my faith and in the love that I have for others. Amen.